1931, Mohandas Gandhi declared, if India gains her freedom through truth and non-violence, I feel convinced it will be the largest contribution of the age to the peace of the world. At that moment, Gandhi stood before the world as the revolutionary and spiritual leader of the Indian people. Sixteen years later, India was free. But independence had not arrived without horrific violence between religious communities. This is Delhi. It used to be my family home. But in 1947, my grandparents, my mother, my aunt and my uncle left the city for good. It was the moment that they stopped being Indian, the moment that British India became two separate nations, India and Pakistan. That division, partition, was something that Gandhi had dreaded. Gandhi's dream had turned into a nightmare. In the twilight of his life, India turns its back on Gandhi. He's sidelined for his failure to master political negotiations. And his vision for the future nation-state is dismissed. Even India's most deprived reject him as their leader. Yet today, Gandhi's revered as the most important Indian of all time. So why is he remembered as the father of the nation? In September 1931, Mohandas Gandhi, aged 61, arrived in England. His mission? To win India's freedom from the empire. Then came the little man, still scantily clad, but with an extremely wet blanket around his tiny frame. I'm sure he must have been frozen. We were in thick overcoats. Gandhi had spent most of his life fighting for the rights of Indians. In time, he became the figurehead of the battle to free India from colonial domination. His crowning moment came as he led 70,000 of his countrymen in a non-violent protest against the punitive tax on Indians collecting their own salt. The violent British clampdown that followed brought international outrage. But also international acclaim for Gandhi. The man in the loincloth had shattered the moral authority of a superpower. Finally, Britain was listening to Gandhi and he was invited to London to take part in the Round Table Conference on India's future. At last, he was in the capital of the empire, poised to bring freedom one step closer. It was the opportunity India had been waiting for. The hopes of a nation rested on Gandhi's shoulders. King George V was persuaded by his advisers to invite Gandhi to the palace for tea. On his first visit to England 43 years earlier, Gandhi had dressed like a true Victorian gentleman. This time, there would be no mistaking his nationality. He would not adapt his appearance for anything, not for the British climate and not for its royal family. Invitations for tea with the king clearly stated that morning dress was required. 
But Gandhi felt he could not oblige. It must be remembered, he said, I am a humble servant of India's impoverished millions and must dress as they dress. Nothing more and nothing less. King George V, the Emperor of India, was clearly unimpressed. He described Gandhi as this little man with no proper clothes on and bare knees. At their meeting, he warned him, I won't have any attacks on my empire. Gandhi refused to be intimidated. When asked by reporters whether the king had given an encouragement towards India's independence, he replied, only God can give encouragement, not kings. And when questioned about his limited wardrobe, he simply said, the king had enough clothes on for both of us. But shortly afterwards, he left by the front way. And then they really did see quite a lot of him, even his knees. Gandhi's understated manner carried overwhelming power. It was how he intended to bring down the empire. Many who met him couldn't help but be impressed. That's a picture of me in 1931, the year I met him, standing of all places. One of these was a six-year-old boy called Tony Benn. Well, father was Secretary of State for India. He invited Gandhi to the second round table conference, but he asked Mr. Gandhi if he could bring his children to see him. And when I went there, I, ex I don't know what I expected, but I, 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 I don't think I had a very clear idea. But the one thing I noticed was that unlike most adults, when they talk to a child, they pat you on the head and talk to your dad. And he was sitting on the floor, and he said, come and sit down. My brother, who's 10, and I sat down. And I have no idea what he said, but he made an enormous impact on me, treating us seriously, which children often feel no one does. But he did make a very, very powerful impression on me, and I became interested in him and in non-violence and in the campaign for Indian independence. What do you think the appeal of Gandhi was at the time? The modesty of his life uh, style was one of the things that made such a big impression. He didn't um, see anything for himself in it, but he tried to inspire other people to do what had to be done, and that's why I think he made such an impact. Ah, that's lovely. I'm coming down. He had come to Britain as a representative of India's poor, and that dictated where he stayed. Gandhi rejected the luxuries of the West End, where the other delegates were staying choosing instead to accept an invitation to stay here in the East End amongst what were then the slums of Bow. Most of the buildings have since been demolished, but the hall that Gandhi stayed in has survived. In 1931, Kingsley Hall was run by a Miss Muriel Lester, a Christian and a pacifist. This is the cell where Mr Gandhi is going to sleep, of course. If the weather's kind to us, as they say it's going to be, he'll be able to have his bed outside, which is his custom in India. It was described as a people's house where the workmen, factory girls and children of Bow could come together. It was a place where Gandhi felt at home. Gandhi's aim was to win India's freedom by winning the hearts and minds of the British people. And he seemed to have succeeded. Everywhere he went, people were enthralled by him. He even won over a potentially hostile crowd in Lancashire. Mr. Gandhi, I want to offer you a hearty welcome to Darwin. In the mill towns of the north of England, hundreds of workers were unemployed, 